Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. On this week's program, the governor's budget advisor and the Senate Majority Leader outline their budget priorities, and a lawmaker makes the case for archery, hunter safety, and angling in the schools. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capital Report. Welcome to this week's program, I'm Shannon Lurkey. In mid-February, Governor Tim Walz issued his blueprint for the state's next two-year budget. In recent weeks, the House DFL and the Senate Republicans have also released their targets for state spending. Joining me to provide greater detail on the governor's priorities is the Commissioner of Minnesota Management and Budget, Myron Franz. Thanks for being here. Glad to be here. Thank you for asking. As a former teacher, it's no surprise that Governor Walz has education as part of his priorities, both E-12 and higher education, though he recently said that the demands of higher education, he's only just beginning to come to under understand. But what are the goals of the governor's education spending? It's really important, as you said. I think one of the keys in the E-12 education area is to really increase the funding formula. I mean, that's sort of the magic thing around the capital here is how much money do we put on the formula? And the formula is that is that mechanism by which we distribute money to all the different education uh, school districts around the state. So he wanted to increase that by 3% the first a year and 2% the next year, which is a really very a big part of the budget proposal. So he wants to make sure, but also special education. He wants to increase funding for special education. As we all know, special education continues to become more expensive and it eats up a bigger part of the formula. So if you can really add money to the special education, you really ensure that the 3% and 2% on the formula really are effective. And then the other areas in pre-K funding to make sure that we keep those slots open for pre-K around the state. So though the E-12 education is really fundamental issues to deal with, but also full, full service community schools is an idea that he wants to promote too. In the higher education area, you said it well, he really learned a lot during this process. I think one of the things he wants to do is to get a better handle on what are the cost pressures in education. I and mean, one of the things that we actually gave some more money to the University of Minnesota and Minnesota State University uh, system uh, based upon the revised budget, in part because the, the both systems reached out and gave some more information about what it is that they need. So I think what he would like to do is make sure that we can provide the kind of uh, education for higher ed that we need at a cost that most people can afford, and that's the key, is education is growing at such a fast rate, more than inflation. And we, we need to figure out how to tackle that. Let's turn, um, if we can, to health care. <clears throat> Several polls in the 2018 election, uh, voters indicated that health care was among their top priorities or concerns. What are some things that Governor Walls is proposing that would increase the accessibility and affordability of health care? Well, first, of course, is the provider tax. As you know, it's set to uh, sunset at the end of 2019. And that was a deal reached back in 2011. But it's been around for almost 26 years. It was a bipartisan effort to help fund health care costs. So we have got to expand or continue the health care access, uh, the, the provider tax going forward. Otherwise, we have a billion dollar hole in our health care access fund in 22 and 23. So without that, we're in real trouble. But beyond that, he wants to change and go from reinsurance to a direct subsidy to, to people who buy insurance on the open market. Right now, uh, the, in, in this year and, and last year, we used a reinsurance model to do that, and that pays down premiums across the board in the, in the individual market, but it's kind of an inefficient model, and the governor prefers to give direct subsidies to people who are paying those premiums. So that's going to be one issue we have to resolve with the legislature. And the other thing he wants to do is bring down the cost for those people who don't get the federal tax credit and who do get the, the his 20% premium reduction, but they still pay more than 10% of their income to health care. He wants to have a tax credit available in 2021 that would, that would help provide a tax benefit or tax credit to those people who, have, uh, who pay more than 10% of their income to health care. So those are the issues he's really working with. And then in 2023, we want to have a One Care Minnesota model that provides a public option for anyone who wants to participate. So the one care is something perhaps coming in later years, not necessarily for this next budget year. Exactly. And it's not ready quite yet. It's going to take some more time to develop. But on the national front, we can see we may need that sooner rather than later. Yes, with potential changes in, in Washington. Yeah. And of course, we have to talk about transportation funding, roads, bridges, and transit. The governor would raise the gas tax, the registration tax, motor vehicle sales tax, and also authorize trunk highway bonds to pay for the projects around the state. 
This would raise a significant amount of money. Is the need really this dire? Have you driven around lately? <laughs> lately, yes. <laughs> and, you know, it is always funny because we do this in the spring and it's always pothole season. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just one example of issues we need to address. But, yes, the need is clearly, I think one of the things that happened uh, during uh, Governor Dayton's term was this discussion about how much do we really need to upgrade Minnesota's overall infrastructure with roads and bridges and, and, and transit. And we really felt that it was like $20 billion over 10 years. And so everyone's kind of agreed on that need. And so this package would generate $1.9 billion in 22 and 23 every two years. So it would fill the need to not just maintain, but to take Minnesota and take the infrastructure up. Because we've been graded at like a C or D from a lot of different engineering groups in terms of our quality. So the roads and bridges, it's not just about, you know, making them look nice and, 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 and feel good to drive on. It's about safety and also about you know the economics if you're in business in minnesota you need those roads to get your profit or your uh, your your uh, product or your services to market so it's in everyone's best interest a couple other areas that have <clears throat> received attention are the lack of affordable housing across the state both urban and rural and also the lack of affordable child care for working parents what would the governor like to do to address these needs? The first thing in the child care area is to increase the subsidy or the support for the child care assistance program. That program provides assistance to low-income families so that they can have access to child care And there's facilities. been a waiting list for years. I know. And this would we would buy down the list a little bit more, not completely because it's pretty expensive to do. So that's one thing is to really make child care more affordable to more people. But, of course, the other thing is we need to get the rates up because uh, we need to have more child care facilities available around the state, especially in greater Minnesota. That is a true problem in greater Minnesota is just finding available uh, uh, child care. So that's a problem, and it's really expensive. So that's one area. The other area that, that you mentioned, the affordable uh, housing that's affordable, he, he, the governor's bonding proposal would put $150 million into uh, housing that's affordable as well as upgrading some existing housing, and then he would also promote uh, home uh, homework starts with home, which is a really successful program. But he's really that was the one area he did not change in his revised budget was in the housing area because he feels so important. He feels that's so important. That area is so critical to education, to, to health and safety. So he's really focused on on housing. One more thing, uh, in terms of big areas, the governor f has frequently spoke of one Minnesota, and having come from Greater Minnesota. He continues to make a case for community investments um, all across the state. What are some specific investments in communities all around the state to keep them healthy and thriving? Well, he does, you're right, he does want to make sure that people at the local level have the funds to make decisions at the local level. He trusts their decisions and thinks they should be em empowered to do that. So local, uh, local, uh, county, uh, local city aid for cities, a county program aid for counties, we would, we would reduce the sales tax on construction materials for local governments so they could engage in more construction projects at a lower level. So those are some of the areas, but the broadband is another one across the state. Everyone, the people who say you don't need broadband expansion are the people who already have broadband, right? So, I mean, that's another critical area. So he really wants us to make sure that we push out, well, the child care assistance program expansion I mentioned, that'll happen all across Minnesota. The, you know, the, the, uh, the $1.9 billion in, in transportation funding we would generate with his, with his gas tax plan would benefit all of Minnesota. So he's really focused to make sure that we deliver some good services to the people of Minnesota wherever they live. Now, the governor's uh, budget proposal is larger than both the House and the Senate. If there, it, will the state still be healthy if a budget of this size goes through, considering the potential economic downturn, downturn coming in the future? Great question. In fact, we got that question from the rating agencies. Every, uh, every year after the forecast, we call the rating agencies to let them know how we're doing and what the governor's budget looks like. And one of the things we told them was uh, our budget does make sure that we don't touch the $2.4 billion rainy day fund that we have and that we would still be balanced in in the, the budget year, and we'd, be, we'd also be balanced in the 22 and 23. So what they see us doing is maintaining, you know, balance into the future. They see us using bonding money to, for capital projects. One of the things they like to see is that states take care of their assets and their infrastructure. So they see our $1.2 billion bonding bill proposal as another th another way for us to maintain the right thing, uh, the things about Minnesota that make it function so well. So we, I believe that this this budget really is sound for the future 
you know, and if we do, do see more of a downturn, we'll have to see what happens in November. But right now, I think we're well positioned. Commissioner Franz, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Joining me is Senate Majority Leader Paul Gazelka to outline the Senate's budget priorities. Welcome. Here we are again. Here we are again. The Senate budget comes in at $47.6 billion with increased spending directed to both E-12 and higher education, as well as health and human services. So let's start with the education piece. What are your priorities in that area? Well, we, we got a number of dollars from for safe schools that were vetoed uh, the last session, so we want to make sure that that's one of our highest priorities. So we have $75 million for that. And then we put money on the formula to let the schools decide which way they want to go. But the details still will be worked out in the, in the education committee, just like every committee. But those are some highlights. So some, but some additional funding is going for education above and beyond just the, the increase that happens over time. Is that correct? Yeah, and we wanted to make sure people knew that there's about $700 million of money that's automatically increasing that sometimes people don't consider an increase. We do. Uh, but we do spend money above that as well. One category that falls both under the heading of education and also health and human services is mental health. And you've spoken about this on more than one occasion, more funding for mental health for students and also for others. Who are the others? What is the importance of mental health right now? So again, last year there's different issues that were going forward. We have mental health resources for the ag community. That will return again that we want to get done. For um, farmers? And the, yes, and we want to give the, the school districts flexibility, whether it's uh, uh, counselors or people that they bring in. Uh, there's like something like 50 suicides, teen suicides every year. We know if we address that issue at the school that we can prevent a lot of those. It also makes our schools safer. We've had two school shootings in the last 50 years, 50 years, but how do we you know, eliminate that so there's never more? And so. That's why we want to focus on mental health, and then Senator Senjum uh, created more resources related to bonding and mental health, and so we're trying to flesh that out as well this year. So mental, more mental health access for different groups of people around the yeah. state. Uh, what are some of the other priorities in health and human services? I know that there's been a lot of work done on elder and vulnerable adults. Uh, what, what else beyond? Well, those are two important ones that are, are, we're still moving forward. The opioid bill actually went off the floor just recently. Uh, that will be in conference committee. It's important that we see that all the way through to the governor's desk. We've really been working on that for a couple of years, so it's not done until it's done, but it, it feels like we're there, and that'll provide more resources for counties and, and dealing with kids that are, uh, as a result of their parents being addicts and, and um, letting them go, we're gonna reach out and, and make sure they have money for that. Plus, we're gonna help fund programs uh, in different places that are working. In my community of Little Falls, the hospital, the school, and the police all are working together to reduce this problem. We're piloting that program around the state and country, so resources will be going to things like that as well. So that, that's probably one of the biggest ones. And then same thing, you mentioned the, the elder care. That's a bill that we didn't get over the finish line last year, so those are the two that we're focused on. Elder care is moving forward. Even from last session, there's been more a compromise and working out details as far as cameras that can be placed uh, within a nursing home to watch the the loved ones those kind of things but I'm going to I'm committed to seeing those both get done this year and those are the priorities I'm going to focus on anything else in that area though that you want to mention no there there are many many areas in that in that whole area it We're is gonna, a huge area yeah I mean it's it's over it's it's uh, I believe it's 15 billion dollars or, or more and we will ask our chairs to look to make sure that we're doing that properly. One of the areas is making sure that uh, child care, that we're any area that, that is being mismanaged, we're going to clean that up. I mean, that would be another area we've talked about. But frankly, that budget is huge, and there are so many areas that we have to work in. Uh, let's turn to transportation. In the press conference, you announced your budget numbers, and you were very clear in saying that $8 billion will go for roads, bridges, and transit over the next two years. What are the sources of that $8 billion? So we combine all the money coming from the federal government and the state government. The state government is gas tax, tab fee increases, general fund, sales tax on vehicles. I mean, there's, it's a massive number, but we wanted people to know that there's $8 billion that we get to use, and some of that could be for potholes. But, but the other part I remind people of is two years ago, 
for the first time in over 10 years, we added new ongoing money to transportation. It was half the sales tax on auto parts. It generates about $500 million in the next two years. And then every cycle after that, it's still um, putting money in. And then in addition to that, I'm open to spending money from bonding. Last two years, we spent another $500 million on roads and bridges in bonding projects. I'm willing to work uh, towards that with the governor as well. So point is, we have lots of money. We just have to make sure that we're putting it in the right spot. Roads, bridges, fix the potholes, I think everybody could agree, should be prioritized. Let's turn to the area of taxes. Will there be any tax reforms that you propose this year, any tax cuts? What's the picture for taxes? The biggest thing we have to consider is tax conformity. In November of 1987, or 19, 2017, sorry, <laughs> not that long ago, uh, we passed, a, the federal government passed a tax bill that we have to conform to. We want to do it in such a way that we're not raising taxes and we're not lowering taxes. So. Uh, we, we have some conversation about lowering tax brackets, but in the end, the tax bill won't increase or decrease taxes. It'll just allocate it depending on, on how we conform. So getting this conformity piece done won't necessarily impact the budget. It will just make it easier for people to file their taxes in future years. Is that kind of the gist of it? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, versus the governor and the House use that tax conformity to raise taxes. And so that, that, there'll be a struggle there. Uh, the tax bill that this, or I mean, the spend budget and spending bill that the, try to get there right, okay. The, the budgets that we put forward and the tax bill that we have is, is basically the place that we can be without raising taxes. If we increase spending anywhere within our budget, then we have to talk about raising revenue as well. And so that'll be the big conversation going forward. Are there any tax cuts though that you'd like to see happen? No, we're not doing any tax cuts. Um, we are proposing, for example, on the middle class uh, that they would get a reduction in their, their, their income bracket, that it would go down a little bit. But that means that somewhere else taxes are changing that would increase that. The tough part about conforming is that when we conform to the federal government, it brings in more money into the state. And we're just saying we don't want to raise taxes on Minnesotans, but we're also not trying to lower them right now because we have a, a big budget that we have to figure out. Right. Makes sense. Uh, there have been calls for increased funding in the correctional facilities for more staff uh, because there was an increase in assaults over the last year and resulted, resulting in two deaths of guards. Is this a priority in your budget? Will the corrections get more money? So it is a high priority. We set a target already. The, uh, the the chairman there, Senator Limmer, is saying we have to have more money, so that's what he's advocating for. Uh, I'm going to lean into his expertise to figure what the right amount is, but at this point we have the budget set at $25 million for that area of additional money. Um, it is a priority. Uh, in the end, we cannot let that uh, be, but be funded in a way that's not good, so we'll keep working towards the right solution. One final question before we go. Um, are you hopeful that there will be agreement in coming weeks, considering Minnesota's status as the only state in the nation with divided government? I, I am very hopeful. I have a good relationship with the governor and the speaker. We talk on a weekly basis. We've already passed a lot of bills that were not easy to get done, uh, that required votes from both sides. That's typically what you need at the end of session. Uh, we're going to pass our budget bills early. We're going to agree to final targets, uh, numbers that all three of us agree to. That's going to be early. If all of that happens, and so far much of it has, we'll get done on time and we'll pass a budget that Minnesota will be proud of. Senate Leader Gazelka, it's always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. A few weeks ago on this program, I spoke with Senator Carla Nelson about her bill that would allow school districts to count snow days as instructional days. This week, the governor signed the bill into law. As the author of the House version, I would like to commend the bipartisan and bicameral efforts that went into the final bill that addresses the needs of school districts instructional hours requirements and ensures compensation for all employees of our schools for lost hours as a result of the historic Minnesota winter weather this year. I hail from the southeast part of our state, that part of the state that got hammered over and over and over in historic manners, so much so that even after closing school for 12 
days, some 13 days because of the unprecedented snow and ice. There were more days that needed to be closed because the roofs were collapsing. Tons and tons of snow on the roofs of our schools and the schools were not safe. So our districts have had unprecedented challenges when it comes to fulfilling the law that we require regarding the number of calendar days and hours. And as those days were piling up, it became very clear to me that there was not enough time in the calendar to make all of those days up. I'm really grateful to be here today to talk about two things that as a good Minnesotan I love to talk about, school and weather. Um, if, you could, if you could have had football in here, we had the trifecta of a bill. Uh, but uh, this was a compromise. There were some issues to be worked out. There was making sure that we were looking back at local control and, and that we were taking into consideration a, a fairly wide variety of, uh, of opinions, although with a very common goal. And this is what governance looks like. It looks like setting down, working together, finding working solutions. And the whole goal of this is, is to make sure that we get, uh, again, our children home safely to and from schools, that we allow local control to make these critical decisions, and that we make sure that we're paying the folks who are there. Senator Justin Eichhorn is promoting a measure that would potentially allow schools to adopt a physical education curriculum to teach kids about outdoor activities like angling, hunting, and archery, activities that have a strong cultural heritage in Minnesota. He joins me now to talk more about it. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. This bill would instruct the Commissioner of the Department of Natural Resources to create a grant program that schools could use to add curriculum and activities like archery, hunting, angling, trap shooting, and firearm safety in Minnesota schools. So where did this idea come from? Well, it kind of started over the summer. Uh, last year, Iowa actually required schools to do firearm safety as part of their phi ed curriculum. Now, we didn't want to, you know, put any mandates on our schools, but we wanted to give that option. You know, a lot of folks in the state had firearm safety as part of their curriculum when they were growing up, but it's mostly went away. For me, I think the safety in the firearm safety is extremely important. The odds somebody in Minnesota is going to encounter a firearm in their life is pretty high. We want people to know how to properly handle them, um, and that obviously that'll prevent injuries in the future. Also, we thought the other pieces of the bill were important. Um, you know, Iowa required just firearm safety. We thought, you know, let's make it Minnesota. Let's build on it, and that's why we added the angling, the hunter safety, the hunting education as part of that. We're going to have them teach some history and culture of hunting in Minnesota. Uh, the trap shooting piece was actually added by another committee member, uh, but trap shooting, as you probably already are aware, is one of the fastest growing sports in the state and everybody can play, which is kind of cool. So. Yeah, actually, I, when I was reading more about this, trap shooting is already a big club sport. There yeah. are, according to the Pioneer Press, 343 teams. It's co-ed. Team members can even letter in the sport. So some of these things could just be added as a club. Why the make it part of the PE curriculum? Well, not everybody joins the club. Somebody might be on the football team or the basketball team and wouldn't be exposed to this. One thing we're really seeing is especially kids in the metro school districts aren't being exposed to it at all. Um, for example, my former legislative assistant, when we were working this bill out, he said, you know, I would have loved to have had this opportunity. My parents didn't hunt or fish, but if someone would have showed me, I might be a hunter or fisher today. And I think if we start getting those kids into the path of hunting and fishing, we might grow the next generation of Minnesotans who care about conservation and care about hunting in our state. Uh, the other thing we hear from the DNR quite a bit is our licenses are going down. And if we get some of those kids in and get them interested and hooked on it, hopefully we'll again start raising our licenses again and make that ne next generation of Minnesotans that want to care about the outdoors. It's an interesting thing that you just said because uh, you're talking about city kids, urban kids, not having, because you're from greater Minnesota, where this is still maybe a greater part of a person's lifestyle than it is for these city kids. So just exposure. I would say just exposure, and you're right, it, it is a, a greater part of life in greater Minnesota. A lot of kids do get this at home, but there's still a lot of kids that don't, and we want those other kids that aren't exposed at home to, to be exposed to this. Is there an ideal age range for this program? Uh, would it be like annual age appropriate programming or just middle school or different um, segments at different years? Who decides, how does that work? So that would be, you know, kind of up to local control. It would be up to the school district. The DNR individual would come into that school district. But normally what we kind of envision and what we're seeing in the, 
very select few schools throughout the state that are actually doing this already is it's more at the middle school age when you know kids are starting to get their hunter safety their boat and water safety snowmobile safety those type of certificates that they would be looking to get that's kind of the age range it would be more geared at but it's certainly scalable up or down the bill states that the DNR commissioner must consult with and incorporate recommendations from Minnesota's tribal groups. Uh, what's, what are you after there? So that's part of the hunting piece of the bill. We think that if we're going to teach hunting, we should also teach why hunting is important to our culture in Minnesota as a whole. But we also have a large you know, indigenous people's population in the state. And we think it's important to also include why hunting is important to their culture as well. In my district, I have I love each like band and you know throughout all of Minnesota there's several different bands and we think that it's important to incorporate why hunting is important not only to their culture but to our culture as a whole in Minnesota and bring that all together. Why these particular activities that I laid out you said in committee you want to encourage kids one one aspect of this is to get off their devices and fall in love with the great outdoors but why not snowshoeing or cross-country skiing which I know some schools already have or camping or geocaching or canoeing why these particular ones? Well, we had to start somewhere. Hopefully some of those things you, you mentioned we can add at a later point. Like I said before, some schools are already doing snowmobile safety and um, boat and water safety. But I, what I really wanted to get at was specifically the firearm safety because, it, because it's a safety issue. Um, those other activities kind of go in line with that, and that's why I thought that was a good starting spot. Uh, but I do think if it's something that school districts like and, and, and do want to continue, we can certainly build on this in future legislative sessions. Now, the issues surrounding guns are polarizing in our society. So inevitably, there will be parents who don't want their children exposed to a firearm safety course. Would they have the opportunity to opt out? Again, that would be a local control issue. That would be up to the local school districts. But much like other hot button issues in education, maybe sex education or something like that, where parents have the option to opt their child out of it, I would assume most school districts would go that route, but again, we left it open to local school districts to decide. Uh, the Senate, the House, the governor were in the midst of budget negotiations, and Senate leaders are expressing caution right now because of the possibility of an economic slowdown. So considering that there are limited dollars, why is this effort important? Well, a couple things. Um, I think most importantly, um, if we get the next generation of these kids interested and engaged in hunting and fishing, those are going to be the next generation of people buying licenses in our state. So on the back end, it's certainly good for the state. There are a lot of priorities, but again, this is just, it's just a pilot. We're only putting a million dollars to it, this biennium just to see how it goes. Um, and again, we'll take another hard look at it in two years. So it's a small amount of money compared to the total budget, but something that I think will go a long ways to promoting you know, all those things we love about the outdoors in the state. Senator Eichhorn, thank you. Thank you. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.